It's clear why Muslims are so proud of their scientific history. Between the 9th and the 13th centuries, just about the only people on earth who were doing good science were Muslims. So he had really very good Muslim scientists, people like Al-Farabi, like Al-Razi, like uh, uh, Jabir ibn Hayyan. They created modern concepts. Of course, some had been learned from the Greeks. There was a massive translation effort early in the 9th century. And that translation effort kept moving with time. But there were a lot of original concepts created by Muslims. So one could say that between the 9th and the 13th century was the golden period of Islam. Then it started going away. And if one looks at the last 800 years, you do not see any major invention, ma major equipment, major new concept that has been created by Muslims. So antibiotics, electromagnetic waves, genetics, whatever, computers. Muslims have had very little role to play in that. And that's led to some introspection. The question is, why did this happen? And here there are competing explanations. Conservatives say, well, we lost the faith. Had we stuck to what the Qur'an tells us to do, we would have been great as we were in those times. And here the orthodoxy asserts that because there was drinking and dancing in the courts of the caliphs, because of the Mongol invasions which pretty much leveled Baghdad in 1200 and something, all those were events which um, just destroyed science in Islam. However, I would contend that that's not the case. If you look to see how science came into Islam, it was basically because of a, of a spirit of tolerance and of inquiry, because after all, that is the basis for any intellectual discipline. You had, in the earlier days of Islam, that as it expanded outwards, it came up upon the treasures of Greek um, intellectual achievement. And it wanted, it's, Muslims wanted to know what's in those books. It wasn't that it was a divine duty, but it was natural human curiosity which impelled them to want to know that. And then there was this major translation effort, which included Christians in particular. So Hunayn ibn Ishaq is one of the great translators of that time. Now, this happened in the, in the caliph's courts, and those caliphs, people like Harun al-Rashid or al-Mamun, they were the liberals of that time. They belonged to what you could say is the Mu'tazila school of thought. The Mu'tazila had come up in opposition to the Asharis. The Asharis were those who believed in predestination. The Mu'tazilas believed in the power of humans to determine their destiny. They believed in rationality. They believed that you could use logic in order to um, solve theological problems as well. Now that led to a conflict between the two. So you had a kind of a battle, a battle which became actually very bloody between the predestinarians and the free willers. Over time, the orthodoxy won. And after the 14th century, essentially after Ibn Khaldun, you do not see any big names among Muslim intellectuals. That, I think, is the tragedy of Muslim civilization. And it's one that it has yet to recover from. Every Muslim majority country today, and there are something like 47 of them, have science in their colleges, universities, schools. And science is not a tabooed subject in any country, including Saudi Arabia, which is the most conservative of Muslim countries. In spite of that, in spite of some considerable investment in science and technology, you do not see a Muslim presence in this field. Take, take any aspect of science or technology. I mean, this, if you look at 
the names of authors on scientific papers, for example, you'll find that there are occasionally Muslims, but they are usually Muslims who live in Western countries or developed countries. So what's the problem? This is an issue, I mean, this is a question which has no simple answer, but I would contend that science at its most fundamental is all about inquiry, all about wanting to know causes. And there is the scientific method, all right? You might argue there is no the method, but it is all about human imagination and inquiry and rigor in the application of logic, of reason, of verifying things empirically. Now that happens to run in opposition in the way that Muslim kids are brought up. I am perhaps generalizing a bit, but if I look at my country, I see that children are taught to obey. They're taught not to question. They're told that what's in the book is there for good and you cannot open your mouth about it. You cannot challenge your teacher. In, in my university in Islamabad, I try to break this habit. I, I make it, in fact, a requirement of my students. I've, unless they ask me questions, I'm not going to teach them. But what happens is that only a small fraction of them actually do summon up the courage to ask. The bulk don't because that's what they've been taught in schools. And so it's the authoritarianism, but it's actually embedded in tradition. The traditional concept of education is that knowledge comes from above. It's encoded into books. All you have to do is to read the books and um, just figure out what's being actually said over there. That's the kind of attitude which leads to a huge number of people saying, oh, all science is already present in the Quran. If you read it carefully enough, you'll find quantum mechanics there, genetics, even black holes, beginning of the, of the universe, the Big Bang, so on and so forth. But that cannot be true. After all, it is only after science comes up with its discoveries that you have these apologists, I'd say, running back and saying, no, no, it was already there. There's not a single example of a scientific prediction. The, the only way in which Muslims will be able to break with this absence of science in their countries is by accepting the premises of the scientific method, which means you've got to question everything. Now that's viewed as something very dangerous by the, by the orthodoxy that exists in those countries, but that's a battle that'll have to be won. It doesn't matter how, how many buildings do you create in the name of science, how many departments, whether you import Americans or Europeans, or whoever to come and work in your universities, ultimately it's got to be a cultural change. Ultimately it's got to be a different concept of knowledge. That knowledge is created by humans. Knowledge is not present in something that's been revealed. That is for your ethical and your moral guidance. It's not for determining the laws of physics or telling you how to do gene th synthesis and so forth. That's an attitudinal change that we're still waiting for. With globalization and the internet and boundary, physical boundaries becoming irrelevant, you see that the diffusion of modern knowledge into Muslim countries is actually taking place. Not only are there universities and research institutes, but actually there is now an increasing number of Muslims in these countries working on scientific research problems. Now, the success has been largely in applied areas, in things like agriculture, irrigation, and the engineering knowledge that's been gained is substantial. You see now that um, 
in many Muslim countries, the ability to extract resources has vastly increased. No longer must you depend upon a Western oil company, although that dependence still exists, certainly, but it's become less. However, the abstract kinds of knowledge, which are really necessary for, for quantum leaps, that sort of thing still does not exist because that requires greater intellectual sophistication. In time it'll come, I'm sure it will, but for that it, there's got to be that attitudinal change. You've got to give people, individuals, the space in which to develop themselves, develop their creative faculties. Without that, it'll be more or less taking prescriptions that exist in engineering books which will be implemented upon. <laughs>